Hello, everyone, and thanks for being here uh, with us at this webinar in Investors in Web3, <laughs> Episode 2, on the blockchain at HEC uh, Zoom. So I'm David Serves, uh, President of Blockchain at HEC, and I will moderate this event with Ethan uh, in M1 at HEC Paris. Um, and we just actually we just joined the, the core team. So as you know, this uh, this professional group is dedicated to to sharing knowledge and educating about Web3 economy, uh, blockchain, and also connecting ecosystems. So on, on behalf of Blockchain at HEC, I would like to to give special thanks to our prime sponsor, PwC uh, and State Capital Group, as well as the partners HEC alumni, HEC Paris, and all the the 80 speakers and companies that have already come to, to shed light on the Web3 universe. So in terms of timing, we'll have two blocks of uh, 30 minutes, 30 minutes presentation and 30 minutes uh, question and answer to come back to, to the topic of today. We are, we are very happy to welcome Alexis Dupelou, a partner at Exchange and member of their investment committee uh, of the Digital Ownership Fund specialized in Web3. Uh, Dimitri, Dimitri Nichun, currently VC analyst for White Star Capital, which is an investment platform specialized in tech and especially Web3. And, uh, and Alexandre Coveillot, partner at Paladin Ventures, which is an early stage fund specialized in the decentralized economy. So I will uh, leave the floors to our, to our, to our host. So please, uh, uh, for example, uh, Alexi, if you want to introduce yourself, uh, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, so, hello everyone. So, Alexi, I'm partner at Exchange. I actually, I just uh, turned uh, into part, uh, a partner um, this summer in July. Uh, I joined the team okay. five years ago. Um, prior to that, I, I, I tried to be an entrepreneur. So, I, I launched two startups, uh, did a small um, uh, fundraising with BAs, um, and um, and so, because uh, Exchange uh, invested in Ledger in, in 2015, um, we started to, to take seriously all the Web3 topic at that time. Um, and, and so, since 2017, I'm, uh, I'm leading the practice with uh, Cyril uh, Bertrand, which is a um, managing partner at Exchange. And so, because um, the space uh, has been quite active in the past two years, actually, we decided to launch a dedicated fund. Um, so it's it's not raised yet, um, unfortunately, but it will be soon, hopefully. Um, so we, we are halfway uh, to first closing. We, we are expecting to close it in, in, in December. And so I invested in uh, so I'm, I'm board member at Coinhouse uh, that raised the 40 million, um, the crypto uh, European crypto bank. Um, I'm, I'm invested in Dogami. Um, so I think Bilal spoke here uh, couple of months ago um and so i'm leading uh, the, yeah the and it will come and it will come back for sure nice <laughs> uh, bilal is everywhere and um yeah. <laughs> i i put a, a small uh, ticket in the morpho as uh, as well you know so it's a it's a DeFi protocol on top of, of compound nice. and ave um they, they, my... they came they came just on tuesday actually very nice ah, cool it was um, yeah, a really small ticket because uh, exchange was not allowed to do tokens uh yet and finally, I invested in Request Finance. Uh, it's um, an invoicing solution for Web3 uh, backed by Exchange and Balderson Capital. And then so, um, yeah, with a very nice traction these days, actually. And so, pleasure to meet you all. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Alexi. Maybe we, we go in the in the, the clock round. Like, uh, so maybe, Alexandre, if you want to continue. Yeah, no, very happy. So uh, I'm Alexandre Covello. Uh, I founded Paladin a year ago uh, to invest into Web3 and blockchain projects. Uh, I've been a VC for 12 years um, back in London, came back to Paris uh, two years ago uh, during COVID. Before that, I was in private equity and before that in consulting. Uh, I raised my first fund in 2000, um, raised $60 million at the time before the bubble burst. So, you know, if we need to discuss bear markets, uh, I can go back uh, a little bit. And Paladin is, a, I'm eating my own cooking. Uh, Paladin is a tokenized fund. So we invest uh, in companies uh, through their equity, uh, giving them tokens that they can redeem against uh, capital that we provide, but also against uh, support services. Uh, and we'd like to see ourselves as a very active hands on uh, investor. The other thing is that uh, I'm based in, in France. 
the fund is not regulated by the IMF because we can you know, go uh, beyond that. Uh, but we invest globally and we're trying to bring uh, you know, global uh, international companies to European investors, uh, some French, but mainly uh, Europeans. Excellent. Thank you, Alexandre. And finally, Dimitri. Yeah, so but maybe to explain uh, how I discovered the blockchain, because uh, this could be an interesting topic, maybe. Uh, I first worked in a law firm um, in uh, 2017, and I mainly did regulatory research on ICOs, where um, it was booming, especially on fraud cases. And uh, that's how I discovered blockchain technology, and I loved it because it was a bit more innovative uh, than the legal research uh, I usually did, uh, to be honest. And I felt a great potential, yes, in this technology, and it pushed me to, to apply for an internship in startup to discover blockchain more closely. So I worked in a, in a, in a DeFi startup called Equisafe, where Bilal El Alami was CEO of Equisafe, and right now it's <laughs> again, so as again you... Bilal. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yes, so basically after that, I worked at Exchange Capital uh, with Alexi. So uh, great moment uh, with, uh, with you, Alexi. As usual, mm -hmm. where I focused on cryptocurrencies and uh, metaverse issues, and I was involved in dogamine fundraising. So uh, that was like a, a cool journey. And uh, now I'm at White Star Capital on the digital asset fund uh, signed uh, last February across uh, three verticals, uh, which are DeFi, GamePy, and Web3. So in DeFi, we are looking at, uh, for example, automated market maker protocol and exchange on yield stacking, ball lending, and so on. On gaming, on the play to earns yields. Uh, web3 studios uh, to transform video web2 video games into web3 video games and uh, what we call web3 is like uh, all around wallet nft marketplace things like that so yeah very happy to be here today excellent thank you dimitri maybe uh Athan, you want to, to continue with the, the first question yeah for sure uh well first question is kind of to kick off the interview. Um, how are you guys doing in this bear market? Um, I, I, maybe I can, I can take that one so, because I, I've, I've been answering that all day long yesterday on the farm <laughs> reading day at, at Cannes. So, okay, um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so actually, um, we, we, we won't invest in, you know, um, liquid tokens uh, already listed. Um, we do seed investment. Uh, we to, we are invested in um, you know long term use cases um so you know uh, devops tools uh, you know security audits of smart contracts um so uh, yeah tool for developers um it can be um you know tool for web2 company to actually you know aggregate payment swap stuff uh, you know help cfos you know wire money and so you know uh, obviously, you have um, you, uh, uh, the current market trend, which is a bit stormy. But um, you, when you have the confidence to to be in the sense of history, like uh, you, you you don't care. If you ask an intern um, uh, out of top engineering school, what would you want to do later? You know, one third uh, replies, uh, "I want to work for climate," or something linked to that. And one and twenty five percent want to work in in Web three. If you look at the, um, the commit uh, on GitHub, um, you know, on a Web3 related topic, it didn't like decrease that much. So you have many skills, talents, building like amazing tools. Um, so I'm a big believer in that. Like I don't care about you know how Bitcoin is doing these days. Like uh, I'm, I'm sure that in, in the next years, like uh, people will build great products. For sure. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alexi. May awesome you. answer. Maybe you want you want to complete, Alexandre, Dimitri. Yeah, yeah, sure, bro. I think the worst is behind us currently. Um, we are no longer in a beer market, you know. Uh, we are, I would say, in a teddy beer market currently. <laughs> because, uh, because, you know, tokens have stopped falling um, as they did for the last three, four months. And we are currently in a fairly neutral zone, you know, in terms of token price. Uh, when we are looking at the micro level tokens and that's where things are getting uh, interesting again from an investment uh, point of view because we can provide investment with a low token price value so when there will be a, a bull market in the future it will be interesting for us in terms of return so um, yes this also allowed us to to sort off the noise to refocus our, our projects with funding teams that have real expertise on the subject so 
So Cyprien, I guess Cyprien from BIM probably. Yeah. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you for, for your, your comments and thanks for your explanation, Dimitri, also. Alexandre, maybe. Um... Yeah, since I'm here, I'm the smallest firm, but the older guy uh, on, on the call. Uh, I'll go back to a few crises that I've been through. So, like I said, you know, 2000, 2008, my first one was in 1987, by the way. Uh, but I guess uh, there is one golden rule in private equity, which also applies to venture capital, which is, you know, the golden rule is you shouldn't, you shouldn't be timing the market. So as asset managers and asset allocators, we are paid by our LPs to invest whatever market conditions. And I think, you know, that's something we need to do and we need to deploy the money, deploy the funds in the best opportunities out there, irrespective of whether the market is good or bad. Um, so, you know, you need to deploy and that's, I think, what we're all doing. And if you look at all the funds, I know the free uh, today on the call, but others, uh, there are still deals being done, maybe less than during those two very uh, exciting years of 2020 and 2021. But we're still deploying. Uh, we're still deploying money. Uh, so that's one comment. The second comment is like I feel very much hangover. Uh, on the one end, on the other end, it's like it looks like COVID, when suddenly everything like slowed down and stopped. I think we've been through five years of intense innovation. On, on blockchain and DeFi in general. Uh, so 2017, 2022 have been really crazy. We had to cope with a lot of innovations, new business models, new technologies, new things coming out every day. It's not bad to be able to stop and slow down a little bit and spend more time with the entrepreneurs. Uh, the first thing that I'll say, we'll get back to that at some point, is I think there is a convergence on many aspects between Web2 and Web3 in terms of valuations, in terms of many things, one of them is the fact that Web3 companies need to make start making money as well. And at some point, they will need to start selling to customers as much as Web2 companies. And so for that, it's also a, a good way for us to, you know, to value the go-to-market plans, uh, see what the products are doing, and how, you know, how, how that, that new technology can become proper, could become proper businesses. Ethan, go, go ahead, please, if you want. Yeah, I mean, actually, there's a follow-up question uh, for the bear market. It's actually uh, kind of related. Uh, how do you detect uh, good performance? Well, as you said, everyone, a lot of people are still building. A lot of students uh, coming out of school are still interested in Web3. Uh, how do you detect a good performance for the next cycle during the bear market? Uh, Alexi, maybe you, you, you're mute, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No, actually, that's a great question. This is where we actually dig, you should dig into specific cases. Like, um, so, so, like, I, once again, like, I don't think uh, I'm, I'm targeting um, usage that will um, be affected that much, uh, you know, with the market. So, obviously, you know, when all NFTs are down and you don't have many stories of people getting rich in two weeks, obviously it does not attract consumer as, as fast as, as before. Nevertheless, um, I do think like, um, you know, if you target um, use cases in B2B um, where institutionals, uh, where corporate will actually uh, soon uh, be paying or get paid in crypto, uh, or um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you will avoid, uh, you know, the short-term, um, you know, um, bear market and, 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 and slowest adoption, basically. So, um, and same, you know, having someone starting building a product today, it will be on market next year. So if you're bullish, you know, as I am uh, on, on, on several topics, I think... Uh, I think um, we should be fine. So now, you know, you have 5% of people using, you know, having wallets and stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm not into much into the um, targeting these guys. Uh, I'm, I'm for the, you know, 99%, I would say. So I'm not talking about, you know, 80 million NFT sold in New York uh, at Sotheby's. Uh, I'm, I'm, I want to use NFT to actually code basic stuff uh, that was a success in Web2. So, you know, loyalty program, cashback, uh, HR's benefits, 
and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm looking at, once again at the next step. So so obviously you have a lot of money to, to be made and, and, and you can bet on, on, on short, short term stuff. But uh, at Exchange, we, we tend to, you know, I look five, five years from, from now. So. Awesome. Uh, maybe Dimitri? Yeah, yeah, sure. But in fact, in the beer market, um, I think the market easier to detect, um, you know, performers because um, all the average projects have not merged, uh, have not managed to raise because of this beer market. Uh, it's just easier to see the best project uh, right now. Uh, there is not the noise um, as before. And uh, yes, I think as uh, Alexi mentioned, uh, it's really important, especially in DeFi project to have a really token utility behind this project. Uh, APY uh, with a 80% per year, uh, I think it's not a good idea. Uh, and uh, people think uh, this uh, the same way of, of thinking uh, too. So, because I mean, it's, uh, it's like a Ponzi, Ponzi scheme. So, you know, uh, all, all, the, all the great entrepreneurs, all the great uh, builders are focusing on deliver great products. Uh, which have a, a strong, uh, a, a strong line in the future. You know, a strong vision to to achieve a, a great exit or a great uh, great startup, basically. So, it make bear market made it easy to 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 see this kind of projects. Awesome, uh, Alexander. Yeah, and no, I, I guess the, the question was also around you know how do you uh, how do you select companies uh, you know in, in this environment. And and the or you know how do you select you know web free companies or blockchain companies? I think the short answer is that you know once you're an, once an investor and always an investor, uh, you know it's always the same thing. You need to being a good investor is about you know seizing the opportunity, but also assessing the risk that you are happy to take and onboard at the time you close the investment. Uh, and I and I think you know uh, one thing that I would say again you know going back a bit in time uh, when I started like in 2000 investing into technology, I was like an internet inv investor. And then I became a digital investor and now I'm a web free investor. Uh, I think, you know, those titles will continue changing. Uh, technology will change, uh, but the business models uh, will uh, always prevail. And I was about to say, will remain the same. They won't remain the same. I think the big difference between web free and digital is that digital is like two dimensional, whereas web free is like, you know, four or five dimensions. So understanding the repercussions of, of the different business models uh, is also something you need to you need to be to, to be assessing. And, and, and to Dimitri's point, uh, you know, in this bear market, you need to be even more careful of backing projects. You know, we were all very excited uh, the last two years. Uh, you know, maybe closing deal that we shouldn't have done, which is a, some sort of a winner's curse. I think now it's time to you know value the companies for what they are. Uh, focus again uh, on the best teams and the best products uh, and on the best outcomes for for the market. Um, but again, putting things things a bit into perspective, historical perspective, um, you know, if you were to back uh, some players back in 2000, would have you would you know would you choose Google? You know, would you choose Yahoo against Google? Probably, you know, Yahoo was a big player at the time, and then you know, and nobody so. Uh, Google coming now we know uh, over us is history. I think the big dif difficulty today is that we may be backing companies that we find very exciting today that are doing extremely well. Uh, that may not be there in three years' time because you know their model don't work. Uh, doesn't and we'll you know, and it's very difficult to find the right one. I think the difficult thing today with an emerging technology such as you know blockchain and crypto is trying to understand which companies will be uh category defining leaders and uh, that's not easy yeah awesome uh, you yeah know, you, you uh, never think about the power law into venture you know the good thing about what we do compared to other private equity investors is that it's okay if we don't have like you know 20 out of 20 home run in the in the portfolio we can try things we can take risk we can go sideways uh, provided that we have a couple of fund returners. Uh, so that also means that we can be, you know, more open to testing new things. Um, and in the end, if you look at our, our, our portfolio of a VC ends up being diversified, we tend to do different things. You know, we talk a lot about the successes, uh, but that's also because we've tried and taken risks on some other 
things that maybe didn't work. Yeah, for sure. Uh, moving on to the next question. Actually, you, you already touched uh, on my next question. So uh, what is the difference uh, in approach of investing in, let's say, tech internet company and now Web3? Uh, uh, do you invest in equity, in tokens, or in hybrid most of the time? Yeah. So it's it's much more difficult to appraise uh, competition, I think, for um, for Web3. Because uh, you know uh, everything is faster in that space. You know it 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 goes faster, like it it collapses faster. You have probably you know there is no frontier. So usually you have one good US team, one good uh, team per per country in Europe for for a given topic in SaaS. But like um, it's a nightmare in um, in uh, in blockchain because you have a lot of smart people working on it and going fast. Um, so I think it would be the difference, um, and I don't have the right answer for that. Like uh, you need to talk to users basically when you do your due diligence and due diligence and, and and do it quickly. So you have a, you need to have a a, a good network. Um, that would be the major difference. Then, you know, it's sometimes the topic is getting a bit more intense on the technical side. So you know, investing in Morpho. It was a small ticket, so we had to 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 trust the people they they used to work with. Like, uh, but I could not, and I can show you that audit myself the code. So, so yeah, a lot of diligences, being fast, having a good network, but not only in Europe, probably. No, I, I think also there is a huge difference in terms of financial metrics. Um, as Alexi mentioned, so in Web two invest. Um, web two investors are looking at ARR, MRR, GMV, tech rate from marketplace, CAC, LTV, court, and so on. Um, but in Web3, we are more looking at FDV, token price, market cap, circulating supply, vesting, uh, which chain has been chosen with funders because it's very important, uh, especially for a DeFi or GameFi project. And uh, yes, then at White Star, we invest both in equity and token. We are flexible of uh, all kinds of investments, both alternative and cumulative. So. No problem for that. And we have technical, uh, for technical issues, uh, for small contracts, uh, we have Quant, uh, because at Whitestar we have also a, a digital liquid fund. So basically a crypto hedge fund. So guys I, uh, are very, very uh, good in this kind of uh, topic because uh, as I like see, I, I'm not a coder, so. Awesome. So yeah, I also invest both in equity and, and tokens. Depends, you know, I mean, it, it's the different pool, different pool of capitals. Uh, some of the institutional investors that I represent or, or that are my LPs, uh, most of them cannot invest into tokens. And so we all we face the issue that, you know, we could do SAFs, but when they convert, we basically don't get the, the tokens. And so we, we miss part of the upside. So for now, uh, you know, given the legal structures available for fund managers, it's still difficult to be investing into tokens, uh, but you know there are ways around that. Um, and it's interesting because I, you know, I, I would tend to, I, I very much agree that the, the metrics at which we look at in Web three are different from what we we could look at into Web two. But I think there is a convergence uh, here. One of them is around valuations. Uh, there was a big a big difference uh, over the last two years that's converging. Uh, and it's also converging in terms of usage. Um, you know, I picked a metric. Uh, if you look at the daily active users, um, uh, you know, in, in Web2, and you can get the, the, the stats from, uh, from, from Mixpanel, for instance, um, you get on average, you know, an 11% uh, usage uh, for digital companies. Um, if you use Dune, which is an, a, a, the most reliable source, in Web3, uh, funny enough, you get exactly to 11% as well. Uh, you know, it's 16% for NFTs and 9% for DEX. Uh, so in the end, in terms of usage, uh, people are using Web2 and Web3 in the same way. So at some point, the metrics will converge and they're already converging. Maybe, maybe directly, uh, more or less directly linked. Thanks to, to thanks to Nicola for his question also. Nicola from London is actually one of our representatives in, in based in London for from blockchain in UK. 
uh, HEC in UK. So um, if you invest in tokens already confirmed by Alexander and Dimitri, do you tend to focus uh, on the life cycle of the token or the life cycle of the business itself? Do you have the same time horizon? Uh, and error, yeah, with uh, ROI. More or less like a question about the timeline okay. and the life cycle. Yeah. And because I forgot that aspect, yeah. Um, so Xor is not able to invest in token yet, and we didn't want to do alternative uh, stuff. You know, you can use warrants, uh, you can use SAFT, uh, but because we are in the process of getting um, an agreement from from the IMF, so the French regulator, uh, we don't want to start. You know, doing doing grey stuff uh, right now. So um, actually, I'm having session with the IMF every two weeks. Uh, to get the license for exchange to in, um, invest in token. And actually, all of this started with uh, the GAMI because we invested in the equity part of the GAMI and then we were supposed to, to su su subscribe to the SAFT part and we were not able to do so. So, and this is when we decided to hire Luke from uh, the crypto company Ariani to lead the crypto fund. And so we expect AMF to provide us the right to invest in token. Uh, probably uh, in December, maybe January. And we want to be the first uh, French fund, uh, you know, uh, completely French, uh, governed by French law and regulated in France. Nice. Okay. And so, yeah, regarding Does your... It inspire... Yeah, does, it, does, it inspire, does it inspire also yeah, regarding this question? Does it inspire the other speakers maybe also? Yeah, yeah, no, sure. But maybe the it was starts to invest basically in tokens um, since one year and a half ago, maybe. I would say I'm not sure about that because I was uh, hired this year. But uh, yes, we, we were among the first uh, to invest in tokens in France, uh, even for international funds. So, um, yep, basically, uh, we are really looking at the token utility when we invest in token because it's really important. Um, if it's for DAO, you know, it's more governance token. But um, once again, for DAO, it's a very specific case. Uh, it's not uh, comparable to GameFi or DeFi, where the token price has a strong importance uh, to, to, to build a, a, a very nice company. So, yeah, I think, you know, uh, the, the most important thing that is uh, to not have a inflationary models, you know, uh, with uh, with the tokens. Uh, for example, when you are in the gaming for GameFi, um, it's my personal point of view, but I think it's better to have a, a cap uh, for your tokens to not have a, a circulating circulating supply, uh, which is unlocked because it's very uncertain in terms of uh, fluctuation of price. So things like that, you know, you, you are we are already uh, reviewed this kind of uh, features, this kind of uh, uh, topics. We are also analyzing, you know, the circulating supply. Uh, what are what is the circulating supply? Uh, uh, what is the vesting schedule? Also, which is very important because if we arrive at the end of the vesting schedule, uh, the token could collapse. You know, so we are also looking at the concentration, just the concentration for for other investors into these tokens. So uh, yeah, there are many, many, many things you know to to deep dive before uh, investing tokens, especially if the token is already launched. So because there are two different approach. First one, when the token is launched, isn't launched yet. And the second, when the token is already launched. So it's not the same way of thinking, you know, so. Yeah, no, I, I would very much agree with Dimitri. I mean, in the end, you know, tokens are much more liquid in financial instruments uh, with which you can do many more things that you could do with shares. Uh, so irrespective of the fact that like uh, Alexis said, uh, we don't have, you know, the legal fund structures to, as of yet, to invest into into tokens. There are really two different instruments, and so when you when you invest in them, you need to have a, you know, probably like more of a public uh, listed equity mentality when you do tokens. And why people, you know, do have some sort of hedge fund like approach, and then investing into into equity, uh, you know, compares more to investing as as a private equity investor. Uh, the other thing that you know people tend to forget is that um, you know, token, I mean, ICOs um, are booked as revenues for the company, so they're normally not dilutive, whereas equity is. And then the other thing, there is a question in the chat around valuations, because you know, most of those projects have been able to raise through tokens, 
they could book that as, as revenue, so they have cash. And that's very different from a normal company that needs to raise by stages, like pre seed, seed series A. Here, people are gonna end up like with a lot of money with which they could either run away and do a scam that happened a few times or build a proper company uh, and start building the business. And so what we see is that when they came to the second piece of raising equity, uh, the business was much more advanced and commanding higher valuations. And so I think you know, it's a two-step thing. You, you could also miss the equity piece, but like Dimitri said, when, you, when you're out of the, all the things that you can do uh, with tokens, and, and also you need to understand the tokenomics quite well, which is not, not very difficult, uh, but you need to have someone that, uh, that, you know, that's on the top of that, on the team. Yeah, for it's sure. Not, it's not that easy actually, you know, when I invested in Nogami, like I will, you know, <laughs> be totally transparent. Like I, I didn't know what was, you know, the value creation, uh, and how, how it was split, splitted between, you know, equity and token. And, and now that I, you know, uh, preempt and, and now I, uh, we built a, a, a shareholder argument um, that, that makes sure that everything flows through the holding company uh, regulated by equity. But at the very be beginning, I didn't know, you know, what I was doing um, on, on the token part. For sure. That actually touched on our uh, next question is that uh, what is the difference uh, between valuing a Web2 company and a Web3 company, especially the matrix that uh, you put into work uh, to offer valuations? Well, the valuation, you know, you, you will be scared. Uh, you know, um, when you do seeds, you only you know, they take a dilution and 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 then an amount raised and 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 then it gives you the valuation basically. So we don't reconcile it um, to to any metrics or or fundamentals basically. Uh, it might be foolish, uh, but actually, you know, you, when you only shoot for uh, for um, companies that can actually um, do a, a huge multiple or a big exit you don't really fine tune anything uh, when you come in. So that was a, the world of before. Now maybe we will, you know, uh, lower a bit the expectations of founders um, some, from time to time. But, you know, we are still in a very uh, an highly competitive market. Uh, things are moving fast. Um, and, and so, you know, usually you just take, um, you know, the, the founder takes a risk when he wants to raise a precise amount. But if you want to go uh, for it, you should go for it. Because, you know, even in Web2, um, we said no to Miracle because they wanted 28 million valuation and we wanted 25. I passed on Exotech. Um, because, um, you know, I do, did the term sheet at 68 and they wanted, well, they wanted to have 72 million valuation. And both of them are huge unicorns, you know, and, and, and when, you know, you're shooting for a big, you know, outcome, you, you don't fine tune uh, the term when you come in, basically. And maybe we can also, you know, uh, compare um, classic post money valuation with equity, with the FDV in tokens. Uh, because you know, FDV is a token. Uh, it's token price multiplied by uh, by your circulating supply. So, yep, total supply. Sorry. So, yep, it's a kind of things that can compare between them. And um, for example, when you invest in token, you are looking at the cap table uh, as the same in equity, because in equity you have the classic cap table with the classic ownership uh, guys who have ownership on it. And on the token part, uh, in tokenomics, uh, on Every tokenomics, basically, you have a small part of tokenomics which is allocated uh, to to the team. So, a team is founders, could be also investors, business angels. So, um, this is the kind you know uh, uh, of things uh, to 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 compare the, the two different cap tables. And uh, yes, about the valuation. So, before the beer market, there was really really high valuation. I would say, for example, in gaming, uh, there was uh, just four five guys. You know. Uh, without gaming uh, backgrounds and uh, they raise I don't I don't know uh, 100 millions 
uh, stuff like that, and not joke. So uh, um, right now, thanks to the beer market, uh, I would say uh, this kind of the same guys uh, are raising uh, maybe at uh, 10 million instead of uh, 100. Uh, and this guy need to have a strong gaming background right now. So guys from Ubisoft, Blizzard, uh, and so on. So um, there is it's totally uh, different uh, than before. Um, valuation was corrected thanks to the beer market. And um, yes, right now it makes more sense to invest in a, in a game five project uh, like that. And it's the same for, for DeFi. Um, before, you know, there was many, many founders uh, who just uh, raised money uh, like that with a computer engineering background, uh, just with a one year after the, the, the engineering school. And uh, right now it's really difficult for this kind of founder to raise, even if they have a strong, very strong value proposition for the startups. Uh, right now it's more like uh, guys uh, from Ethereum foundations, uh, really strong background in engineering that uh, that can raise with uh, with the best uh, reps refunds. So definitely not the uh, same uh, like before. Yeah, I completely agree, which gets back to the first question. You know, this is the time you should be investing all the time, uh, irrespective of the market. And this is probably, you know, the best market to be investing in. Uh, you know, we, we tend to report performances by vintages. So, you know, I'm not sure that people that threw a lot of money uh, in 2020 and 2021 at crazy valuations will get the returns they're expecting on those. Whereas, you know, we all, you know, a lot of people have cold feet and are not investing now, but those who have some dry powder, uh, you know, well, like we have, uh, we are, we're lucky that we can invest today in better teams, better products at probably better prices. Uh, so, you know, we, we can get like performance, you know, we can get, you know, performances, returns that will be better with like lower uh, valuations at exits. If we get the same valuations at exit, that we had over the last three to four years, it's going to be even better performance. So, you know, it's in bear markets that you make the best deals if you're disciplined. Uh, to what Alexi said, uh, I think, you know, there is this concept in, in venture capital of the anti portfolio, all the things that we haven't done. So, I've, all passed on, I've also passed on many, many things that I wish I had done. Uh, we do them for different reasons and a price, we, people, we don't get it. Um, I mean, Bessemer publishes their anti-portfolio, which is an amazing portfolio, uh, things they, that, that they haven't done. Uh, it's not easy, but at some point you need to draw a line in the sand. And if you start, you know, you know, that's what Alexi said, you know, if you have like an offer, if, if you're offering 68 and someone wants 70 and you say, yes, then it's going to be 72, 75. So you never stop. And I think at some point you need to be disciplined in what you're ready to pay. Very, very basic uh, way of, you know, of investing, of buying what you would do for any other uh, acquisition investment when you put money to work. We're not very different from other people. I mean, I guess, I hope. Yeah, well, those are interesting takes. Um, so moving on to the next question, what are some of, the, some of the major areas in the Web3 ecosystem that you guys are focusing on right now or just be, uh, or just bullish in general, for example, like NFTs, uh, Metaverse, DAOs, uh, DeFi, GameFi, and uh, behind all those areas, what do you think is a uh, few main drivers for them? Uh, yeah. like you, you, you said like GameFi mainly for what I heard, but well, the question about the driver side may be uh, very interesting also to understand, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm, I used to be a big gamer. I'm a big gambler, <laughs> so and I really think that uh, you know gaming plus uh, you know uh, making it a living uh, is a is a good topic. So obviously, I will have a close look at at DeFi and everything. So gaming overall uh, became big bigger than you know cinema and TV show and everything in terms of industry. It will be multiplied by X uh, with you know. Um, play to earn and crypto. Um, so I think it's a very powerful one. But uh, at Exchange, we don't bet, for instance, on, on specific, um, you know, game. Actually, uh, we like to, you know, bet on marketplaces and tools that will serve everyone, uh, not one specific brand or, or you know type of games. But I did the game, but it was like 
uh, Discovery One, um, and and once again, you know, all uh, that will be related to developers, like um, all things that would be related to, uh, you know, fintech, but applied to Web three um, are the topic I'm looking at uh, these days. Tre treasury management uh, for CFO and everything. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Yes, so maybe on my side, I think you know the um, before to ask yourself to invest in uh, DeFi, GameFi infrastructures. Uh, I think the, the main thing to 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 think just to to compare different chains, you know, and select the the right chain. You know what I mean? Because, for example, for GameFi, if there are founders who are building their solutions um, into um, Solana, so currently it could be a great idea. Three four months ago. But Solana had many, many, many problems uh, in terms of uh, uh, security, you know. And right now there is Aptos, you, uh, new layer ones with a better uh, transaction speed, with better uh, gas fees, uh, which are not uh, higher, uh, uh, such like uh, Ethereum or or um, change like that. So um, yeah, I, I think you know, you're, you just you, you select your chains. Uh, after that, you can also choose if you invest in GameFi, DeFi, because some chains are built for GameFi or for DeFi. And after that, you can choose, you know, what kind of, what type of startups you want to invest in. So for example, for DeFi, it could be a uh, Yearn, like uh, Andre Conj uh, startups, uh, like Yard Finance, it could be Bro Lending, it could be uh, Automated Market Maker. And uh, for the gaming, um, the gaming side it could be Play and Earn, it could be um, Web3 Game Studios to transform we, uh, Web2 games. Um, but I think the most important thing is, is to choose the, the right chain because otherwise uh, it's not it's not good for the future if you are not betting on the correct chains when you invest in. So it's very, very important to, to, uh, to have this kind of, uh, of thinking in mind. Yeah, no, I very much agree. So I, I guess, you know, uh, to that token, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I started investing at some point on, uh, I was close to the Tezos Foundation. So I started looking at deals on Tezos um you know amazing technology amazing blockchain and protocol but in the end most of the projects that were built on them uh stumbled into some technical issues at some point so i stopped so i guess you need to pick the right um the right chain i would mainly invest on ethereum at this stage um difficult to go on, on other things uh, my background is very much on fintech um out of my portfolio i have six unicorns uh in the uk uh, they're all financial services, they're all fintech. So that's what, that's how I came to uh, to blockchain and, and to crypto through DeFi. Um, and I think you need to specialize. The other thing, is, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I do mainly co-investments. So I, I can try to put the deal together, lead the, lead the deal, but at some point I need like a bigger name to be part of a round. Uh, so for instance, again, you know, we, Dimitri and I, we, we share some deal flow. I think, you know, Dimitri at White Star has a very strong expertise in gaming, which I don't have, uh, but I'd be very happy to tag along with financial services and fintech in general. Uh, yeah, that's more my cup of tea. There is a question in the chat, which I found interesting. So do we invest in two layer ones? Um, I do mainly early stage, so I don't have the money to back on a layer one, um, you know, projects which are very capex intensive. And the other thing, you know, like I said, I I'm happy to co-invest with some of the best uh, web free funds uh, across Europe, across the US as well, if there are some opportunities. The thing is that there is also some sort of a discrepancy uh, on, on the VC world between the very big guys, you know, the Anderson Arabis with 4.5 billion, North Zone just raised 1 billion, and the smaller guys like me or us. Uh, because you, know, you think Cherry Ventures, they raise 30. So at some point, if you want to have a diversified portfolio and you want to pick your bets, there is so much you can do. So I think to answer the question, I'm investing more into layer two. Um, layer one is you now, it's uh, beyond or above my pay grade. Uh, and I guess it's probably the same for why Star Exchange. Uh, it's difficult to be investing into, into hardcore infrastructure. Interesting, okay. But probably that's where the, you know, the, the best businesses are. I mean, that's where, you know, at, at this early stage of the industry, uh, big money will be made in layer one. If you pick the right chain and the right protocol, uh, you're, you're definitely going to be, be making a lot of money. 
and, and again, the big guys in the US will be making crazy multiples on this. Uh, unfortunately, it's not accessible to me. And I'd like to say to most of the you know, average European investors as well, given the size of our funds and how much we can do. So what we can do is like back businesses that are built on those infrastructure. And there is money to be made there as well, and the nice businesses to be made as well. Okay, and a question interesting also from Nicolas about the you know the impact of the merge, uh, and choosing about you know choosing the right uh, the right chain. What what do you think uh, right now? Uh, that could be actually the the, the, the yeah the, the chains remaining attractive, uh, and particularly in this post merge. Uh, time. Well, I said, yeah. you know, Ethereum remains like a bet, so it's most like most of the projects I'll look at will be on, on Ethereum. The rest, I'm, uh, and again, uh, I mean, very small team, difficult to do the technical due diligence. If you start going on chains that you don't really understand, you're taking, you know, adding some technical risk to the business risk, uh, but you're also onboarding uh, when you do the investment. Yeah, and I, I think the main um, the main opportunity thanks to uh, thanks to the merge is to have a carbon neutral chain. You know what I mean? Uh, because the term with a proof of work um, consensus was uh, very very difficult. You know to 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 respect the the, the tendons, the trends uh, currently. Uh, but uh, thanks to the merge, yes, uh, proof of stake system right now. So uh, there is no no carbon problem uh, uh, at all, and. Uh, in the in the following weeks, there will be also the sharding, and the sharding, the sharding allows to to Ethereum to 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 have more speed uh, on on transactions. Uh, so transaction will be faster than before, and uh, thanks to that, there, I think there will be a, a higher volume in in terms of NFTs transactions also, uh, because uh, everything is based on uh, on speed transactions. Because if the speed transaction is low, you pay high guy fees. You know what I mean, and uh, so when you are buying NFT or on X2, Y2, on Magic Eden, uh, on uh, on OpenSea, so on OpenSea because OpenSea is uh, uh, based on Ethereum, so only on OpenSea for Ethereum. But you, if if you buy NFTs on OpenSea uh, uh, currently with Ethereum, you pay strong gas fees. But thanks to the merge and the sharding, uh, it will be easier for you to 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 buy this NFTs on OpenSea. So there there will be like a life. Uh, a life cycle, you know, in terms of uh, in in terms of democratizations, because the less the, the, the price is on OpenSea, the more there will be uh, customers who will buy NFTs, and the more NFTs will gain traction. So the more there will be transactions uh, with NFTs. So I think it's a uh, it's uh, great for the future. So that that be said, I think the stat is that for the time being, Solana is like forty percent of uh, what is traded. And uh, and NFTs, you know, on Solana are like ten percent. Or the price of an NFT uh, you know, built on Solana is a tenth uh, of the price of what a an NFT was on Ethereum. Probably after the merge, that will uh, you know they will revert one to the other. Uh, but you know, buying NFTs, uh, the most successful NFTs were on Ethereum. Uh, Solana has been trying to do cool stuff. Uh, Dogami, if I'm not mistaken, is done on Tezos. Um, but yes, I mean. Uh, with the merge, probably it's going to be, you know, FRM will be, we'll have some sort of winner takes all um, kind of time. Thank you. Judge, maybe a question from Frédéric um, about your background, since uh, we, we understood that it was more like finance background. Um, what, what, uh, how do you do actually to deal with the technical aspects of the, of this, uh, of this, uh, of this industry? And yeah, to, to investigate about the, which about blockchain and and for for and why actually? So I mean the question would be more, what I what are your levers today to yeah, uh, yeah to deal with the technical aspects question? Since yeah. we have more or less like a, an, an audience which which comes from actually business schools today, but yeah. generally speaking, we also yeah. Okay, so um yeah actually I talk to people and I trust people um. And so, you know, um, it has its limitation, obviously, but when I invested to Request Labs, um, I knew guys from Ariane, I knew competitor, uh, Cripsio that raised with Alven. 
um, you know, the best way to get juicy due diligence is it's, it's, it's to speak to probably um, competition and our, our, our companies in the landscape. They will give you the, the you know most transparent and 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 mitigated feedback. Uh, you don't want to hear um, nice things. If I only hear nice things about a company, actually uh, my my radar is is getting on and and I, I try not to move forward. Uh, until I, I get someone, um, you know, uh, say, saying negative feedbacks, so I can actually go back to the founder and and have um, a discussion and and so yeah. Once again, it's um, I it's it's a due diligence work. Um, we don't do technical audits. Um, someone in the chat asked if we invested in Morpholab. Uh, we did. Uh, but it was, you know, small personal tickets because we were not able to invest with the uh, exchange. Therefore, uh, we, we did it as a gut feeling on, on the guys and the opportunity. But we would have uh, needed to do some extra due diligence for exchange, obviously, for a significant ticket. So you say, like, one of the parts of your question is, like, first is, like, team, 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 team. Yeah. And maybe tech is a, is one aspect, but but, yeah, it's not the... Yeah, the main. Uh, yeah, but actually, one, you yeah. know, when you do early stage, you, you're judging people basically, and then your 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 part of the job is also to assess, you know, uh, interactions with founders, and and after that, it's a matter of how they react, how they think, um, and 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 so, yes, yeah, so sometimes it's also based on soft skills. So it's it's good to have like a set of rules, like like Alexandre with you know Ethereum. Um, and and to try to catch the good trends, obviously, so you, you can actually um, um, do um, you know proceeds by uh, uh, avoiding uh, doing mistakes according to your internal uh, rules. But at the end of the day, it's a matter of you know due diligence and 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 and, and interactions with founder basically. Yeah. It's about, on your end, we are. We are using uh, mostly Etherscan, you know, or the current the corresponding block explorer analytics platform for the chain uh, on which the project is running, uh, and uh, to to look up uh, wallets, addresses, and smart contracts. Uh, we are also looking at user engagement. So, for example, by tracking users' adoption growth, uh, the number of uh, unique token holders. We are also looking at uh, network value to transactions. Uh, so. It's the ratio of market cap divided by the transaction volume. Um, it's a similar matrix, you know, to, to the P ratio. Um, and yes, minor activity also, uh, number of miners, validators securing the network and developer activity. So number of uh, developer contributing to the protocols, things like that. But uh, for the smart contract uh, review, as I mentioned before, it's more uh, the, the guys who are working with us um, in the crypto hedge fund. Um, and yes, we are looking at to to edit smart contract before testnet if it's possible, and uh, before mainnet. So, yep, yeah, that's our uh, kind to operate. Yeah, that's maybe good. maybe Ethan, do you want to, to jump on to to another question? Yeah, maybe uh, two two for sure. Uh, two, two more questions. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, because of the time. Okay. Uh, all right. So I mean, how... I mean, so, sorry. So we have then maybe guys. How long could we maybe start? Maybe ten minutes uh, late. Would it be okay for you? At least five minutes more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, Ethan. Sounds sorry. Good. All right. So. Um... How do you explain my next question would be uh, how do you explain to large industrial companies or like companies that are a bit more traditional that are still in web two, the strategy uh, or the stakes that it takes to move to web three and also explain to them that it's not too late to take the leap uh, towards web three uh, adopting the technology yeah. Um, personally, I've never been confronted with this type of situation, but it's always a, a question of competition. Uh, if a large company is similar to yours has done it, and uh, the metaverse is going to take a significant market share on your business, you take a risk to mix the trend. So, 
So it's always a fear of missing out, kind of. Exactly. You're right. <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, that's the way of every business, basically. So, yeah. For sure. Any other inputs? You know, corporates will eventually adopt the technology we're getting there. I mean, you know, some, most of the brands have moved into the NFT world, uh, you know, fashion and uh, sports. Uh, what's interesting is that, um, you know, on, on, on more of the crypto side, uh, the financial services of the big banks, they've adopted, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies. I mean, they've already adopted them. They use them. They have their own, they have their own protocols. So I think, you know, in banking, financial services, in the plumbing of banking, uh, you know, crypto and, and blockchain is already widely uh, used uh, with, you know, people that are very expert on understanding how those technologies work. And then on the more marketing side, uh, there are signs of, you know, again, uh, you know, big banks using, uh, you know, fancy web free technologies to do things that they could do anyway. So, you know, KKR just launched a uh, tokenized piece of their healthcare fund on Securitize, uh, BNP Paribas, uh, you know, is pushing up tokenization as well. So everybody, like, you know, there is the, the vernis, the layer where, you know, people are trying to, the corporates are trying to use uh, the technology to be, uh, to, yeah, to, to be fancy. And then uh, in some industries, uh, you know, blockchain will probably replace uh, most of the, you know, the existing legacy uh, tech infrastructure. That will take some time. It's not probably, it won't come from the VC backed companies world. It's probably going to be big contracts for Accenture, uh, you know, down the road, putting together like very big projects. I mean, as always. But they will adopt it surely, for sure. Maybe uh, if I can maybe ask a question about the intuition aspect uh, between, you know, the, the in your decision making process. Um, the difference, I mean, the ponderation between uh, emotion and rational, how would you, how, what, what figures would you put behind these two, these two uh, pillar and uh, how do you deal with that? It's a tough one, so I gave, I gave you know, millions <laughs> of <laughs> it's a, it's also a tough yeah. yeah right so, so no, but it depends like you know on the game yeah, it was uh, really hard uh, to get a good play to earn at that time uh i found a team um where you have a space with a lot of bullshit with very you know um ga uh, serious guys basically i like the fact that you were you had a, a bcg guy very well structured you know uh, very into you know tangible um, stuff actually, um, and 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 so I jumped on, on the opportunity actually um, on request finance. They were processing you know dozens of million of, of payments, no monetization, but obviously I was you know impressed by the traction they had and and the great logo they had as well. Um, so each each use case is different. The yeah. thing that I I won't do anymore is to bet on stuff that does not work yet. Actually, so I need to have some kind of traction and and to persuade myself that it has you know some kind of of usage and uh, um, it's getting user addictive. Basically, it's addictive to users basically. So so you know obviously I I, I spoke a lot about how. I, 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 we, we have good feelings. We base our things on interaction and stuff like that. But on the other end, I really need to, to, to see products that work basically. Yes. And, um, all, all the information of each stop you get, um, you have to present it in investment committee with other investors. So if you think you are the only one among all the investors who will be able to invest in this startup. Uh, so reason before earth, uh, I would say, otherwise it will be very hard for you to survive in the fund. So that's the, that's the first aspect. And then uh, to avoid BS, you can transform your emotional intuition into rational intuition. So first, the knowledge you store. In second, uh, the, the correct behavior you have with the funders in front of you. You know, you, they bring uh, knowledge to you every day uh, through their deck. 
And uh, finally, the elements that come from discussion on this product on UX UI. Um, so, yeah. Very interesting, yeah. So, yes, I, I, I mean, to wrap up, I wouldn't, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a key point. I, I wouldn't call it intuition. Uh, I think in investment, it's more judgment. Uh, and, uh, and, any, and like any other art, the more you practice, the better your judgment became, become. Uh, what, what's interesting is that some people, uh, not me, some people, especially, you know, you have some in the valley, you have some everywhere, but I have like their judgment is perfect. They, they always strike. And so if you look at the track record, they get all the good companies all the time. Um, so, you know, maybe there is some magic, more art than science, uh, but it's judgment. It's something that you build, uh, you know, along the time, the more investments you look at, uh, the better your judgment become. Uh, but the two things I'd like to add is that one is that um, take, making an investment is, an, is a decision you take at the moment you sign the paper. So you need to be able, you need to be fair with yourself, which is like you're taking the investment decision based on the information you have at the moment you take it. If things change after, uh, but you know, you need to assess the risk as much as the reward. And the part of intuition is like, you shouldn't be carried away by FOMO, but because other people are doing it, because the team is great, you need to assess the risk and that you're basically buying the risk, not the reward. Um, so that's the second rule. And the last one, uh, something on which I'm very, very adamant, uh, especially in venture early stage, uh, we do select companies. So there is a selection process uh, and we invest, uh, but I'd like to think that we also build company or co-build companies with, uh, with founders. And so I think there is also a correlation between very good VCs and how much skin they have in the game and how much they help their founders, as opposed to just having a portfolio approach. And I think, again, uh, the good investors have the good judgment in picking the right bets, uh, but those companies are not only assets. You're not buying a stock, you're not buying a real estate, you're buying companies that will grow. And so your role, and increasingly your role as a VC, as an early stage investor will be to help those companies grow and the more value you bring, you know, the success in the end is part of is all the founders, but you can also help on that. And I think that's also part of what a good investor should be doing. And that goes far beyond sitting on a board uh, on a quarterly basis. It's, you know, it's rolling up your sleeves and making sure that uh, the founders get support uh, on every aspect of building the business. And that's the exciting part, much more exciting than the finance and, uh, and negotiating the term sheet, thank God. Yeah, right, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, maybe one last, please. Yeah, it's okay for you. But, uh, Ethan, if you want to, to conclude, maybe a, a, a question related yeah. to the maybe uh, for the for the student the students community willing to jump into the VC, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my last question will be: uh, if you guys had to give one piece of advice for uh, students or just young professionals coming into this space as an entrepreneur or a potential VC candidate what would this piece of advice be? Well, I can answer to this question because it was my case um, last January, uh, maybe. So first of all, you need a lot of courage because uh, the places are very hard to obtain for full-time um, job. And especially because there is a luck factor. Uh, the fund must be raised at the same time as you send your application. It's a horrible uh, thing to say, but it's true. And uh, after that, if it's for an internship, uh, I think that having uh, an experience in a Web3 startup is a big asset, not only for your knowledge, but also for your resume. It shows that you are interested in the ecosystem, uh, then sign up for uh, free Web3 events and try to networking with a lot of people. You will surely find VC to talk to and uh, networking is your more valuable asset as a student. So because you don't have professional experience. so. Um, I think it's a, the right way to, to come in VC. Any other inputs? I, I don't know. I, I, I was born a VC. You know, it's, my, it's in my blue blood. It's by right. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but jokes of, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a few jokes just to wrap up. So the first one is like, uh, I'm going to be a bit pushy. In France, if you want to be part of a VC community, and if you look at where they're coming from, uh, having done I should say is not a bad thing because you know half of them have, uh, have been through the school, so that's probably very, uh, you know, that's probably a very, very good start. 
Uh, the other thing I would very much agree with, uh, with Dimitri, uh, in the olden days, it was all like, you know, consulting and finance. Um, now you have a lot of people that are, you know, creating background, trying, you know, rolling up your sleeves, seeing how the company works, uh, building your own, failing, uh, that's coming. But the stat, you know, is, is the following. I think it's very less than 20% or 25% of entrepreneurs that, or, or VCs that have been entrepreneurs in Europe, it's like 60 or 65% in the US. So, uh, in, in, and in the end, uh, yeah, before you move, you know, beyond the table with, uh, yeah, with, with a baseball cap and try to and start reviewing, uh, you know, decks one after the other, it's not bad to have done a few things before. Uh, unfortunately, and I'll stop here, uh, French bashing, most of the people in my generation in the French fund uh, are engineers that have gone through the top schools and that at the beginning, there wasn't really a VC industry in France. They all went, they're all male, they're all white, and most of them work for the big telcos companies, France Telecom and Orange, namely. Um, but that is like olden days. I think today, you know, the more diverse experience you have and the more operational, the better. Um, yeah, and then we're also forced, I mean, not forced, but it's, there is a diversity question about, uh, you know, in VC as well. Uh, so trying to have like something different than what we, but you know, the older guys have done. It's probably your best way into, into the industry. And the very last thing that I'll say, like Dimitri said, it's a very closed uh, cottage industry. Whenever you have an entry point, take it. Uh, you know, it, it, if it's not investor, if it's investor relations, if it's operations, if it's whatever, community management, but as soon as you can get into a VC, uh, don't start like schmoozing around, take it and get into the club. Uh, and then there will be many ways to, to grow up from where you entered. That's insightful, thank you. And thank you. Alex. Yeah, maybe yes. I see. If you, if you want to yeah, it's so the same. Uh, you know, yeah. I, 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 I tried to, to build companies. Um, I didn't do that well. Um, I, I, uh, you know, I started at in Morgan Stanley in the US and then I didn't get a green card and then I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I, 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 I did entrepreneurship, but not because I had the courage to do so because I've, I've actually met some people um, as a, on, on a specific week of my life. So, um, and, and, you know, it had much value uh, for the rest of my VC life. So I think that you should not... Uh, absolutely need you don't absolutely need to to get it there straight straight away and actually you have a lot of people out of school that are you know um dislike um starting as a vc because you know being a vc is to uh make an entrepreneur choose you rather than another one obviously you have a brand name but you need also to seduce him to to prove that you will bring value, that you have a lot of experience that you can share with him. And, and so you, you want, it's really hard to go uh, from the very uh, bottom of the pyramid to, to partner in VC. So I think, you know, you know, starting, start, starting somewhere else uh, can, can definitely be a good way to have fun, to potentially become really rich and successful and in either way um, end up as a VC if you want. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. I think it's the time to, to conclude now. Thank you very much, the three of you. Uh, very nice discussion, very nice insight. Uh, thank you, Ethan, for your, your, your moderation, your first moderation with us. And thanks to all of you for your nice questions and, and contributions. I hope uh, that, uh, that this will give you help and more clarity uh, to the people present, as well as the, those who will uh, see the replay on our site. And I remind you, actually, we have the two conferences per week. The next ones will be the 27th uh, with Crypto Market Debrief with Stan from Blockchain Expert. And on the 29th with, with the Blockchain Skills and Jobs, where we give the floor to uh, recruiters, three, four recruiters, I think, yeah, four. Taurus, uh, Digital Token Specialist. Morpho, Morpho Labs with a DeFi Specialist, as, uh, as, you, as you heard maybe before. Octo, a GameFi Specialist. And a fourth one, but it's a surprise, actually. So I wish you a very nice evening. I hope uh, we cross each other sooner or later. And again, thank you.